Hello and welcome. I am Mark Hughes with the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And I wanted to just take some time to get you familiar with who we are very briefly. We will be uh, uh, having a conversation uh, with you this afternoon about uh, systemic racism here. Um, the mission of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance is to secure sustainable power, ensure agency, and provide security uh, for American descendants of slavery while embracing their history and preserving their culture. I am the executive director. Again, welcome. What you can expect to hear from, uh, from me uh, this afternoon uh, is I'm going to give you a, a little bit of a breakdown on uh, systemic racism. You'll walk away understanding better how to identify it and what to do about it. Where'd the, uh, where'd the idea come from, turning the curve on systemic racism? You may not know, but at a statewide level, uh, some of the policy work that we've been doing has led to a joint resolution uh, from the legislature, which has declared racism uh, as a public health emergency. Uh, so we decided to lift a, a campaign uh, referred to as turning the curve on systemic racism, building back a healthier Vermont. Why might you ask, um, yeah, would we be talking about building back a healthier Vermont? What we know is, is that there are a lot of impacts uh, that racism has on us. And what we want to do here as uh, we move through the, the COVID crisis is we want to move on, on the other side of it with a, uh, with a mindset that we want to do, do something better. We want to do something different because what we know is, is that the, the virus laid bare a lot of the impacts of systemic racism uh, within our community and across our state. Before I got started, I wanted to share with you a, a statement that was made from the United Nations. And this is um, a, um, a report of, of the working group of experts of people of African descent on its mission to the United States in 2016. Um, and this is what it says. It says, there's a profound need to acknowledge that the, transit the transatlantic trade in African enslavement, colonization, and colonialism were a crime against humanity and are among the major sources and manifestations of racism, racial discrimination, Afrophobia, xenophobia, and related intolerance. Past injustice and crimes against American African Americans need to be addressed with reparatory justice. So I just wanted to start with that because yes, it is the United Nations. Uh, They're telling us something needs to be repaired here in the United States of America. Uh, they go on to say that in addition to above, the working group urges the government of the United States of America to consider the ratification of the core international human rights treaties to which the United States is still not a party. Uh, with a view to removing any gaps in the protection and full enjoyment of rights therein. It also encourages the United States to ratify the regional human rights treaties uh, to, review the, uh, to review the reservations related to the treaties that it has signed or ratified. So I just wanted to share that because it's always good. Let's go, let's get on the outside. Uh, let's take a look at uh, what folks are looking at uh, you know, in terms of the United States from the outside in. Uh, so um, quite often what we don't realize is, is that there's, there is a, another perspective. We, there are various uh, um, competing perspectives of what's going on with this thing called systemic racism on the inside of the United States. Let's get an outside opinion. So, so here we go. Just want to get into a working definition. This is so important. Uh, this piece about um, this working definition of systemic racism is incredibly important. Let me tell you why. This is at some point or another, we have to come to terms with understanding what some of those core aspects or some of those, those, uh, those um, core characteristics, if you will, of uh, systemic racism so we can uh, arrive at an agreed upon definition so we know who we're talking about, so we all agree that we're talking about the same thing. Um, this uh, definition from uh, Joe Fagan and Kimberly Ducey from their book called Racist America is what we've settled on. There are many, and you know, I think that there are also some common characteristics though uh, that, that you will find here, and I think 
we'll go, we're going to unpack this for a few minutes. This is what it says. It says systemic racism, it includes a complex array of anti-Black practices, the unjustly gained political economic power of whites, the continued economic and other resource inequalities along racial lines, and the white racist ideologies and attitudes created to maintain and rationalize white privilege and power. And it goes on to say, basically, it exists. If it exists anywhere, it exists everywhere. So again, unjustly political economic power. This is this is a complex array. So, uh, the other thing is continuing economic and other resource inequalities along along racial lines. And then you got the racist ideologies and attitudes created to maintain and rationalize white privilege and power. Exists anywhere, exists everywhere. So that is really what we're framing up here today. So when we're talking about racism, we're talking about systemic racism, you know, we must learn how to delineate overt racism from systemic racism. This is systemic racism, and that's the topic of this conversation. I'm going to show you how we can um, we can talk a little bit about its origins. We'll tell you a little bit about where it came from, and we'll also uh, talk about uh, what we can do about it. But first, I want to give you just some some major elements of systemic racism. Uh, what we know and understand is is where this leaves uh, people of color um, is is impoverished, and where it leaves white people as being enriched. So definitely there is that uh, that disconnect, that, that delineation between, um, you know, where where's the money going? Uh, there's a vested group interest among white people, alienating uh, racist relationships between white people and people of color. Uh, so as you see, the systemic racism is actually causing overt racism in some ways. Uh, the cost and the burdens of racism are born on people of color. Uh, racial power uh, of white elites. And then, of course, you have the power, ideas, assumptions, and worldviews that go along with this whole business of racism. And then, finally, uh, what you have is, is you're, and you're always going to have, is, is you're going to have this resistance to racism, uh, which is why we're here. Uh, see, so these are some, like, 10 of the common attributes that you're always going to, you're going to see. Let's, let's talk about some impacts. Uh, what we'll do here is, is we'll um, what I did is I just threw up on your screen uh, a, a census of the United States. Why am I starting here? Uh, the reason why I'm starting here is, is because uh, what we know is, is when we start with understanding the baseline of the demographics of our population, it helps us to better understand disparities as they exist across all systems. So we're going to come back to this as a baseline. Uh, what you can see here is, is that the, the Black and African American uh, percentage, the population in the United States is roughly about 13.4%. White alone, uh, you see somewhere around 76.5%. We've got some breakouts down there. Uh, Asians at 5.9%, Hispanics at 18.3%. So very important numbers to understand. We just finished another census. Uh, this one is is a little, um, is a, these are estimated numbers, but we just finished another one. But these are, these are good baseline numbers for us to be watching out for uh, as we dig into the data. Because if we're going to look at the impact that has been caused across all of these systems, it's important to understand what we're measuring it against. Let's talk a little bit about poverty. Um, what we see here, and this is according to the Souls of Poor Folks, this is an auditing, uh, auditing America. This is from the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. Uh, this, these data came out over just the last few years. You see again where Blacks uh, are poor, about 63 per, uh, 60.3% or 25.9 million people. We, we know, we see the top line of 140 million people. Now, according according to the poverty line that they said may not necessarily be consistent with the one uh, that the uh, feds are using. Uh, but what we're looking at is, is we're looking at the poverty line consistently across all of these numbers. So what we see is, is that this slide tells you one thing. Most black people are poor, but most poor people are white. 
So that's the um, that's what we're that's what we're getting at here in, in the message, and we'll get into it. We'll get into that in a little bit more. But and what that really equates to is this and this alone is is what you see is is there is a wealth a median household wealth disparity a median household wealth disparity, and what you'll see there is is roughly and this is in 2016 where. Uh, without durable goods, you see that the median wealth of a white household is $140.5,000. Um, and the median wealth of a black family is $3,400. So what we know and what we understand is, is that there are massive wealth disparities, wealth disparities here in the United States and in Vermont. Um, and here are some numbers from the Public Assets uh, Institute. Uh, some of these data sources are from the also the Census Bureau, of the American Community Survey, uh, 2018. But what we see here is, is that um, there's also poverty uh, disparities as well. Here are some outcomes in Vermont. Now you might ask yourself, well, why are we talking about um, why are we talking about all of these disparities? Why are we talking about you know this these numbers? Why so in, in order to understand systemic racism, we must you know at at the what we first must do is is understand again our population outcomes, uh, but we also need to understand um, good understanding on the disparities that are being created. So let, we're going to talk a little bit a little bit about you know what all those disparities look like. And then after that, we're going to go into maybe where they came from. So take a look here. Uh, what you see here is, is you see that 52.2% uh, of Vermont uh, Blacks were vac vaccinated with at least one dose. Um, and then we see that that white vaccination rate is at 61.5%. We see 37% of Blacks and uh, in third graders proficient in the language uh, were 50% whites are. We see that there's 2.5 times uh, Black Vermont students receiving multiple days of suspension compared to their numbers. Uh, um, that is, of, of white, their white counterparts. And the numbers go on, ranging from um, folks who are stopped, uh, fo uh, prisoner, uh, folks who are in prison. Uh, here's some telling numbers. We start at the top with the 1.5% residency uh, here in Vermont of Black folks, um, and then it goes, and it goes on as you see here the median household income. Uh, there's a difference there by um, with over 20, 23 or $24,000. Um, unemployment rates, 4.4%, um, which is, believe it or not, uh, better than the national rates um, because throughout all history, the unemployment rate for Blacks have been twice that of whites. Uh, you've got 25.9% uh, Black population at, the, at or below the poverty level, as opposed to 10% for whites, 24.4% of Black homeowners, as opposed, as opposed to 72%, which are white. And here's a stark one that will just blow your mind, and that is 0.2%, 0.2% of Vermont farms are owned by Black folks. Uh, that is all. So what we know is, is that there are impacts that systemic racism has on uh, Black and Brown folks, and whether it is um, you know, uh, in education, whether it is in unemployment, uh, whether it is in health services, uh, these numbers are collectively staggering. And what I, and what I mean by that is, is it would be okay, maybe not okay, but it would be maybe understandable, perhaps, or maybe we could get our heads around it if one of these things were true. But remember in that definition uh, that I laid down to you at the top of this conversation, if it exists anywhere, it is. It exists everywhere. In fact, it should be. It would be troublesome if there were certain areas where it, or most areas where it didn't. The reason why it would be troublesome is because there'd be deeper issues. But or but what we have is broader issues, uh, and that is is uh, you know we have impact coming at the black community from uh, all, all directions. You know, African um, Americans of descent, uh, American descendants of slavery. You know, besides culturally. What we see here is they're being impacted from the health services system, um, the income and wealth uh, sector, the education sector, housing and land, child development and youth, safety and security. So what we see is, is systemic racism impacting uh, black and brown folks 
uh, coming from all sides and obviously uh, and lately being also exacerbated uh, by COVID-19. So that is the challenge. That's why we started this conversation from a health perspective. That's why we're talking about this being a health emergency. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, you know, how we got where we are. And I think a lot of folks, you know, I think where we miss it is, is we miss our national history. A lot of folks are telling us today, don't talk about our national history. You know, we were we were taught a lot about history in school. It was actually required. The fact is, is that we just weren't taught a lot about our true history. We weren't talk about, we didn't talk a lot about our complete history. So I think you know, a lot of it, you know, starts and stops with our Civil War and post-Civil War history. Um, you know, lately we know uh, that the 1619 story has emerged. We also understand, you know, our nation's history of slavery, the fact that we founded our nation in slavery, that we defined uh, whiteness in the House of Burgess uh, in the early 1600s. Uh, and it was a, that definition that began to allocate uh, resources across United States, you know, we had horrible decisions in our courts, Dred Scott, um, you know, we, we could talk about Plessy versus Ferguson. There are many uh, instances across our history where we haven't done well, but I like to kind of pick up in what they called a great compromise in 1877, because this was the fall of reconstruction. And what do we mean by that? Well, most people don't know that after reconstruction that black folks in the United States had more political and economic power than they have had in all history to include today. In fact, there was a governor um, in, in Mississippi who was a black uh, governor. There was the majority of the lower house of South Carolina's legislature was black. The majority of them, there were black business owners, black newspaper owners. There were black communities uh, that thrived very well. Uh, we. You know, so these, this all, you know, the Reconstruction, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment created, created this and made it all possible uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, what happened during that time, because what we knew, what we know is, is that the federal troops went in and occupied the South. They occupied the South because the former slaveholders uh, were oppressing black and brown folks uh, during that time, and they wanted to ensure their freedom. They, uh, there was a, um, a reparations uh, settlement in the South uh, initially, uh, but what happened is, is that was immediately taken back because President Lincoln, Lincoln was killed uh, before the war, war ended, uh, and um, they began to immediately roll back uh, some of these um, reparative uh, processes, but they definitely took reparations off the table and gave the land back to the folks who owned it in South Carolina and Georgia on the coastal shores. Uh, However, you know, rec reparations did continue to, to uh, the, um, I would say the um, Reconstruction did continue to thrive until 1877 with the Tilden uh, Rutherford B. Hayes election. Uh, there was a compromise where uh, the Republicans who were the abolitionist party kept the White House, uh, but the, the compromise was is they pulled the troops out of the South, which caused, um, which caused the, um, the reconstruction to fall. It caused it to completely fall. In other words, from somewhere around 1877 uh, onward, we took a U-turn as a nation. And I think that's a lot uh, of the history that we don't learn about. We don't learn about the white backlash. We don't learn about the, the mass exodus of folks out of the South because of convict leasing, uh, because of sharecropping, which is how my parents arrived in the, in the North. Uh, we don't talk about um, the um, the um, Red Sunday or the you know the time frame around uh, Black Wall Street or uh, Wilmington uh, or um, we don't talk about the dozens and dozens of um, of uh, of massacres across the United States at the turn after the turn of the century or, or or the war the or the birth of the nation film in the White House under Woodrow Wilson we don't talk about the redlining. Um, we don't talk about the impacts of the GI Bill um, or even uh, how the uh, po politically the Southern strategy has been used to, uh, to pit us against one another and have us vote against our own best interests. Uh, we don't talk about um, you know, how all of this has led uh, to the white lash uh, and the white nationalism that has occurred because it's never uh, been resolved. So uh, it's important for us to take a look at how there has been a contiguous uh, connection throughout all history 
uh, how there have been many things in our nation that have been left unresolved. Uh, that, that is to say, at the close of the war, uh, there was no reconciliation, the, the Civil War. There was no uh, reparation. There was, there was no apology. There was no, you know, it was, it was all put behind us. It, we, were, um, we as a nation decided it was too painful or too troublesome or too political uh, to, to deal with the issues at hand. So we moved forward as a nation uh, after um, 1865, uh, which took us to 1877. So that 12 years, um, you know, although there was a great turn for this nation, was probably the best 12 years that this nation uh, has had because uh, all the way up until the civil rights uh, movement, uh, we have been um, the the nation has 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 oppressed has has sought to oppress and to uh, walk back I should say or even make worse uh, the 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 issues surrounding race in this nation uh, so it's been a constant fight uh, ever since uh, we know that the civil rights uh, era you know brought did bring about some change but we know that we lost we have since even lost a lot of ground since then uh, it's amazing that today that we're still talking about voter rights. Uh, right now across the United States, and we're seeing um, the, again, yet another backlash across the states. Um, you know, I think if there's one thing for us to remember uh, in this conversation, and that is this, and that is to understand that um, the, the War of 1865, the Civil War itself, uh, it is a point of demarcation. It is a time in history that we must uh, pay attention to. Uh, we must um, uh, consider the outcomes of and consider the, um, you know, those things that were not resolved as a result of it. I think that um, as we move into this next era, it, you know, if we are to continue to ignore uh, what happened and did not happen during this time, we will never uh, be able to realize and appreciate where it is uh, that we're trying to go. Um, I think, um, it's really important for us as a nation also uh, to um, to understand the creation of wealth in this nation. You know, as we know, we're talking about uh, wealth if we're talking about systemic uh, systemic racism. <clears throat> and what we know is is that from from the point in which um, white indentured servants were replaced with African slaves uh, and given the authority to actually oversee them or to uh, or to round them up, um, you know, all the way through the Naturalization Act, the Indian Removal Act, the Homestead Act, which granted 270 million acres of land to white people, um, the the, the uh, alien land laws, and many many other um, uh, governmental programs that provided access for white people to land uh, as well as to capital. Uh, following through through the uh, Jim Crow laws and even uh, the New Deal, as well as the GI Bill, uh, Social Security itself, uh, the the Wagner Act, which permitted uh, non-white exclusion, uh, even the Federal Housing Administration by its existence by by creating exclusionary loan eligibility as well as participating in redlining. Um, there you see. Uh, federal subsidies uh, for suburb for suburban neighborhoods. Where did the suburban neighborhoods come from? Well, the GI Bill uh, provided um, for hundreds of thousands of GIs who returned from war, uh, who were white, not black, afforded opportunities to purchase homes in conjunction, this in conjunction with the Federal Housing Administration. What we see here is, is all of this uh, enabled the creation of the suburbs themselves. Well, then they needed transportation back into uh, the uh, the city center for uh, essential services and so forth. So, of course, the transportation agency kicked in and ran uh, transportation, which in the form of major highways through the center of many of these uh, black neighborhoods, bifurcating them and also increasing the traffic through their neighborhoods. So all of this stuff goes together. Uh, the creation of wealth. Uh, of America, uh, it was, it was, it's well documented that it was done by America, by the federal, state, and local governments. Uh, all of this um, amassing of wealth, uh, transferable wealth, generational wealth, uh, was created uh, by public policy. 
So a lot of folks ask us, you know, well, what's going on here? How do you actually see a systemic racism? Where is systemic racism? I don't see it. I heard a gentleman the other day say, well, I don't see it. So if I don't see it, it must not exist. Uh, I don't understand what you guys are trying to fix here. Um, show me systemic racism, and then um, I will help you fix it, is what he said. Um, well, the truth is, is, as our previous series said, is, is, is actually hidden in plain sight. Uh, it's, it, but it's not hidden if you look for it, and I think you're less incentivized if you benefit from it. Um, but what we see here is, is just the, the, a system that criminalizes poverty. Now, let's just do a quick review uh, and talk a little bit about what we've just learned. Because what we've just learned is, is that the vast majority of black people are poor and the vast majority of poor people are white. So what that really means then is if you, if you have policy that adversely impacts the poor, although you will impact more white people in number, the vast majority of black people will be impacted. So the criminalization of poverty is one at the top of our list. Uh, what do we mean by the criminalization of poverty? When we create laws very much like the black laws or Jim Crow laws uh, that have existed on our books, then there are relics of which still exist, but this is still going on. It's not just residual, but it's perpetuating, is, is there, are, there are many laws. Um, where they, they could range from parking, uh, they could, it could be loit loitering. Um, there, in fact, there are some constitutions to include the state of Vermont that says that if you are, you know, for the punishment of crimes, um, uh, not just for the punishment of crimes, but for the punishment of debts and fines uh, and fees and the like. Um, and this, this is um, pervasive throughout all. Um, fi in fact, our, our Title 13, which is criminal law, uh, says that one can be incarcerated if he is unable to pay um, fines or debts and so forth. So this is at its very heart, and there are many, many, many other flavors. Uh, we won't spend too much time on that, but, you know, we can talk about voting laws for the next 20 minutes or the next 20 days in terms of how historically, and especially now with the emergence of you know, uh, voting laws across the United States, again, that seek to uh, cause, cause it to be more difficult uh, to vote, especially for black and brown folks, um, based upon the way that these laws are tailored, the list goes on and on. Are you beginning to see um, the connection to this post this post-Civil War mess that was created. Um, edu the, the education uh, system itself, the, um, the vestiges of affirmative action in education in order to allow, to enable black uh, folks to be able to get into uh, universities <clears throat> based upon harm that was called, caused previously died with Fisher versus the University of Texas back a number of years ago. But, the education system is a much broader challenge, though. There are many issues in terms of sus disproportionate suspension and expulsion rates, disproportionate rates of uh, outcomes of uh, higher education, and the list goes on and on. Um, the education system is a long conversation, but the system itself relies upon federal funding, and many of these systems rely upon federal funding. We'll talk a little bit about that later, but the and we and, but the the whole reliance on federal funding means you have to adhere to the criteria. But we'll talk a little bit about the electoral college right now. The electoral college obviously is a remnant. It's a it's a vestige of it came right out of the Civil War and initially um, implemented to provide to offset the balance of power uh, that the Southern states. Um, were fe fearful that they did not have because they feared that the northern states were more powerful in in their in terms of their electoral power. Uh, so they wanted to balance that power. So instead of having a popular vote because it was more populous in the north, <clears throat> what they would do is, is they would have um, they would have a electoral college where it would balance things out. We see how that is working. The filibuster itself does this sound familiar? Given the time right now, but the filibuster is a remnant. It's a remnant to allow, again, that minority, because at the time, what, we were, what, what it was agreed upon was, and in, in some would say an in, in overcompensation, is, is to give the minority uh, vote 
Uh, in other words, those who are fewer uh, in a body, in a political uh, body, the ability uh, to have the leverage to slow the conversation down, to slow the deliberations down, uh, to be able to gain additional ground in uh, the deliberations. Um, so what we see now is how that's repeatedly been used. And now, um, you know, all you have to do is turn the television on and you will understand the impact of the filibuster today. Uh, the political appointment process, wait a minute. Historically, throughout all history, it has been a white male, usually a landowner, who has um, been able to run for political offices. And then just over this last century, that has changed quite a bit, but you still see the remnants of that. And then they too, of course, they have the appointment process because the executive that's appointed usually appoints their uh, political appointees by definition. Um, Interestingly, it's, it's, it has historically also been the same group of people who are able to vote as the, same, as the, as the folks who would, who would be able to run for office, if you know, if you know what I mean. So you've, you've got to think about what this creates uh, and the power that that builds over centuries. You know, so we can talk more about that, but uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the tax system itself. I think I have a slide on the tax system and how it was created to benefit those with white political and economic power. The court systems, when you think about the precedents today, here's one a huge example. I gave you one on Fisher, but here's a huge example as we see uh, that the court system is stacked six to three right now, uh, leaning conservative, and it's never... Uh, in history been anything other conservative was one small example, and that was still problematic. But what we know about the court uh, is, is that you cannot use, it is, it is unconstitutional for you to use the Civil Rights Act of 1964 or any derivative to repair, to repair the harm that was caused by laws, by statutes on the previous slides that I showed you. To, so it's not possible to go into a court and say, well, we want to repair this. Um, so we have a right to do so because, they, because we have a group of folks who were injured. So it is unconstitutional to do that. So that, there you have it. It's right there in the courts. And, and the court system has many other precedents, which is a, another presentation that we'll, we'll have for you. Um, the public engagement process itself, where what we have is, is we have situations to where um, community entities, uh, state entities, regional entities are required by law to engage the public in, 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 in many cases, specific demographics, demographics, that is to say those who are disproportionately impacted, that is to say black and brown and poor people or folks who are having or who have English as their second language. Um, so they're disproportionately impacted and so there's a requirement that the government must, that the uh, entity must reach out specifically uh, to that population to ensure that what they're doing either benefits them because the, the, uh, the funding allocation was designed to do so, or it is at a minimum not harming them. So the question is, is how's that working out for us? Um, how, do these, how do these entities engage the public? Uh, how, are these, entity, are these demographics actually being reached in a truly democratic uh, participative process whereby they are actually engaged in these processes? And that's probably not happening on front porch forum, if you know what I mean. So um, the, this is how these things play out. So this, this money becomes misallocated because folks who it is intended for they are not involved in the process, nor are they a recipient or a benefactor of its, um, of its uh, acquisition. And then of course, uh, what that comes to, brings us to is, is uh, federal and state funding access requirements. There are many, there are multiple access requirements. That is to say uh, for the state, uh, for the um, local municipality, whereby there are certain criteria that they must meet in order to access these fundings. Why is that important and why does that even matter? Well, in many, in some cases, in, in several cases that we have found, uh, in, in many cases, in fact, the criteria itself creates disproportionate adverse impacts in our communities towards black and brown and poor folks. What does that mean? That means the policy is racist, is policy violence. And, you know, what 
local and state and, and federal uh, local and state entities as they're requesting this money what they have to uh, way out is 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 it more important that they uh, that they acquire the the economic resources or do they abstain from acquiring the economic resources and yield to uh, what is more important is, is the folks the demographic uh, population in the community that that might seem hard to understand but it's not it's very simple that is to say yet yes there are policies statewide policies as well as federal policies where the requirement to actually ascertain those economic assets. It, it requires a, a, an entity, a state entity, to act against the better, uh, uh, you know, uh, against the best wishes or the, or the will, rather, of black and brown and poor folks in their own communities. Yes, and one, and one of the examples that I'll give you just off the top of my head is Title IX, where in which our own Human Rights Commission here in the state of Vermont is, requi is required to include language in their policy that simply says if a person comes in and they are adjudicating a case, um, it, that the HRC may dismiss that case prior to the time that it has been investigated. They may dismiss that case prior to the time that it has actually been investigated. Okay, and so that is, and, and the reason why that latitude is there is because HUD, the funds that they get from HUD, requires that language. Well, that language is in the HUD policy, and their policy must be consistent with HUD's. Sounds a little complica complicated, but it's not. What are the implications? Well, the HRC protects the civil liberties of everybody across um, all public accommodations, housing, education, uh, employment uh, here in the state. Uh, so yes, it's hugely uh, significant. The, bottom, the last one, data erasure. What does data erasure mean? We saw at the top of this presentation that without data, we can't really measure where we are. We can't really see the impacts of systemic racism. If there's no data, then you can't see it. If you can't see it, it doesn't exist. Now, one of the things that we've done, really, and it's the same thing with history. It's, it's the same, same, you know, when we, when we talk about, we hear people saying, oh no, well, we don't want to talk about history uh, because, you know, what that, what that does is that, that's one of those things where um, all you're really doing is just you're just trying to get everybody riled up. You know, you you want to you know you, you know you want to apply this critical race theory, and you're going to make us all feel bad about ourselves. And all well, no, if we don't if if we don't know about history, then we have no idea how we got to a place to where we are to where we're looking at this whole idea of systemic racism. What we can do is we can just assume that somehow or another. Oh, it's just happenstance. It just, you know, it's just, I, you know, it, I don't know how we got here. It's so ironic, so weird. Um, but when we connect the dots and we reconcile with our true history, then what we can do is we can take a look at what we're seeing right here in front of us and we can see it for what it is. Uh, so history erasure is just as important as data erasure. But when you start thinking about data erasure, the reason why it's important for us to begin to go out and find those data that you saw at the top of this presentation is, is so we can begin to understand how to baseline what we're looking at and so we can figure out whether those trends are going north or south. Here's that tax code stuff I was telling you about. You have federal tax policies in their administration. They don't need to be explicitly race-based either to entrench or worsen these longstanding racial inequities or to promote racial equity and inclusion. Historical racism and contemporary patterns of racial discrimination and bias deeply affect a household's income, the types of income, their savings, their consumption. Uh, so they also influence the federal tax code's impact on households on different races. So yes, the tax code itself, the tax code itself is, is not just a relic, it is a standing pillar of systemic racism, if you look how it's administered. Uh, so one of the things that you know, we hear people talk about a lot is, is, you know, when we talk about systemic racism, say, well, what are you going to do about it? I think, you know, for those of you who are watching, and, and, the, and what this is for is, is this, this is for folks who know and understand that there's something awry. You know and understand that there, there's, you know, there is, there's got to be something to this. You know, what, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get you to see and understand that if we take a look at history and we connect that to our data, and what we're looking at, 
that right there, what it does is it gives us, you know, the ability to see it, to be able to see systemic racism. If you don't connect these two, you can't see it, okay? But with the connection of these two, that enables you to see it. But who cares if you see it, if you're not gonna do anything about it? So this is where the personal work comes in. And the personal work, it has to do with continuing to educate ourselves, number one. Um, but it also has to do with actually getting in action. And, and I think part of that, when we start talking about outreach and education, you know, we say that you know, very generically, um, and I'm not gonna get into a lot of details, but what I'm telling you is it's so incredibly important for us to talk to our people, okay? It is very important for you. Some of the best work, especially with white people, is, is to make sure that you are taking what you know, not just increasing upon it, but sharing it, especially when it's uncomfortable, especially when you get to a point to where um, you know, it is a challenge to you. So incredibly important that, you know, the knowledge that you have is to be able to each one teach one to take this message out, to be able to, to talk to one another, because what you, what I know and what you know is, is there are no white families. There are no white families um, that, that, that do not have someone who's being impacted by this to the extent that they're acting it out in an overt manner, racist, okay? There's no white families that, do, that doesn't have that. There are all, all, all white families have someone in a system that is working, every single one of these systems that's working every day that sees and identifies uh, these policies that are coming down uh, from various agencies and also that they are implementing and they're seeing the impact that they're having. Um, and this leads me to my second point is, is there is, I've never met a white person who has not silently witnessed black oppression, not one. Every group that I've been in, every time I've asked the question, I've never got a hand that goes up. So what that means is, is it's a great opportunity uh, as, as folks share to say, hey, speak up. We'll come back to that in a minute. So engagement, advocacy, and then here's some organizational work that can be done. Some organizational work that really speaks to, uh, at its core, you know, a programmatic approach uh, to addressing systemic racism within your organization. This is... This is what was fleshed out in our work, uh, in what we use to create the racial equity executive director's position here in the state of Vermont. This is what I've incorporated into my engagement methodology at the Racial Equity Association, my LLC, my consulting LLC, shameless plug. Um, and in, until somebody tells us, until somebody tells me that there's a different programmatic approach to addressing uh, an organization, um, then this is where, where I'm standing right now, but it is a place to start. And I wanna flag the last one, which is accountability. Turning the corner with us, you know, uh, with, the, with the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, uh, the work that we're doing, we've got four swim lanes. One is platforms and initiatives. You'll see that manifested with uh, ACT at the statewide level as well as Operation Phoenix Rise, Rise here in the biggest town in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, there is outreach and education. What are we teaching? Root causes, impacts, um, solutions for systemic racism. We're not teaching implicit bias. Uh, we're teaching about systemic racism. What does that mean? What is the history? What does that connect with? What are the impacts? What are the, what are the numbers? Where is the data? so we can see it, so we can do something about it. Community engagement and support, uh, a full range of activities and also uh, cultural empowerment. Um, so when you start talking about platforms and initiatives, um, you know you can go out on our website, take a look and see uh, what some of that progress looks like. Uh, check the blog. Uh, with outreach and education, there are numerous uh, uh, events as well as numerous um, presentations that we give throughout the community. Uh, this is just a handful of them. Uh, there are many more. Uh, with community engagement and support, <clears throat> everything from small business grants to financial support, uh, individual assistance, all the way down to personal and professional skills, which would mean uh, everything from adult basic education to basic computer skills, uh, business cultivation, and so forth. We are interested, whether in organic uh, arrangements or in partnerships, and moving uh, this, this, uh, this thing forward. 
this is what we're doing with community engagement and support. As far as, as, far as cultural empowerment, yeah, you know, you'll see us engaged um, in ranging from Juneteenth to our own uh, very own first, um, first African Landing Day, various commemorations, observances, celebrations, events, uh, affinity spaces. Uh, who are we as Black folks? Where did we come from? What is our power? What is our history? What is our culture? What is our, you know, what is our resilience? Um, and so I think <clears throat> uh, these things, you'll see them coming, and you'll see them playing out. Now, as far as your engagement, this, this slide is not complete. As far as your engagement, you know, whether it's the city uh, council, whether it is the Burlington Police uh, Department's uh, commissions meetings, uh, school board meetings, uh, the school board DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion meetings, there is a racial disparities panel uh, that came from the work, some of the work that we've done, as well as a racial equity panel and a governor's workforce equity and, and diversity council. Um, and a fairness and impartial policing committee and the list goes on uh, with all types of organizations that you can be involved with where you can engage uh, where you can ensure that you are there that you are showing up that you are hearing what's going on that you are contributing to what's going on it's what you can do it is a reasonable service how do you address systemic racism um, you know, when, when we talk about addressing systemic racism, at the heart of it is, is economic disparity. So why are people not paying attention to money? How is money being spent in your community? How is money being spent in your school? How is money being spent in your organization? And who is benefiting? At the end of the day, um, that is as simple as that. If you are benefiting, it's hard for you to dial into this. It's hard for a person to be incentivized to, find, to, to look into and look out for those who are not benefiting. Uh, but that is our challenge, that is our charge. Um, what it happens when you find it? Alert the system, escalate it immediately, why? Uh, because more times than not, you're not gonna be dealing with somebody who, can, who has the ability, the authority or the will to address it. Otherwise, it probably wouldn't be going on. Escalate it immediately and organize. More, more times than not, even if you get to the right place in the organization, they would prefer to deal with you as an individual because it's easier to brush under the rug. It's easier to pay you off. Yeah, I said pay you off. That means you know offering political and economic power to you, or giving you, or uh, you know making you feel good about yourself, or giving you the privilege to talk to them, and so on and so forth. Um, but what you must do is organize and demand transformation. No, not change. Transformation. Um, that is, this is how we address systemic racism. We, we have to target policy and we need to start at home. What does that mean? Everybody wants to go out and change national policy. Politics start at home. Um, policy starts at home, uh, in your child's school. In fact, I'll even take you a little bit further. In your house, in your bedroom, in your bed, your spouse, uh, speaking to the folks who are closest to you. All of this starts at home. Uh, bringing this thing in as closest to you as possible and saying, why is this? Why is that? We have to transform this and stop diluting it. Don't dilute it. Don't dilute it. When we say dilute it, what we're talking about is, is, you know, the zero to 60 breakneck speed that a conversation about systemic racism turns into a gender conversation, turns into an LGBTQIA conversation, turns into a, a, a migrant worker conversation turns into an indigenous American conversation. Um, I can assure you that uh, as much as effort that was placed into singularly addressing this thing when it was built, um, if at any given time we had the full commitment as a nation to singularly addre address it, it would completely eradicate every single one of the aforementioned. Rising tides do lift all ships, but you just have to start at the right one. So let's stop diluting this and let's have a real conversation about it. Our history matters. Our history matters. When we start taking a look at where we've been as a nation, you know, it's important for us to take a look at 1619. It's important for us to take a, a look at 1865. It's important for us to take a look at 1877, 1920, 1940, 1970. It's important for us to take a look at 2020. There's, there's been a lot of stuff that's happened, but there, I can assure you, there's a, there's a connection. There's a continuity that has existed across all this his, history, which is why today, even today, we can see a Confederate flag waving in 
the Capitol building on an insurrection day on January 6th of 2021, because it has never stopped, because it has never been resolved. So yes, all of our history matters, all of it. So there's going to be a fight over how to repair this thing uh, and when to repair this thing. Well, how do I know? Because it has been through all history. So in closing, you know, I'm, I just came to tell you uh, that, yes, um, systemic racism, there, there is a, um, you know, there is a public health emergency in play right now. Um, and, you know, as, as these folks you're looking at right here are fighting over this W, What I'm telling you is, is that um, there is a sense of urgency. The sad, the sad part about it is, is we, we've come through a global pa pandemic and a national reckoning uh, with uh, race, and we've still yet to understand and to get the sense of urgency that must exist here. Hope is not lost. We have not given up. We're going to continue to put this message out across the state, across the, um, across the nation, uh, that Racism is a public health emergency. It is time for us to turn the curve. It is time for us to turn the curve on systemic racism so we can once and for all live up to uh, the, um, the so we can once and for all live up to the, the commitment that we've made as a nation, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. We hold these truths to be uh, self-evident that all men and women are created equal. Largely, these statements have been aspirational up until now. It's time for us uh, to uh, move beyond this uh, aspirational message and move to a point uh, to where uh, we're doing the best we can for everybody in this nation. So thanks for coming out. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, contact information will uh, post up. Thank you.